Hey guys, what is going on? It is me, Box 12 here, and welcome back to another Realm of the Mad God Dungeon Guide video. Today we've got our sights on the Toxic Sewers, a mid-tier dungeon acting as one of the main sources of defense, even though you'll probably end up ignoring it half the time. It drops from the Slime God in the form of a blocky and muddy stone portal, at about the same rate as an Abyss of Demons, although I find them to be just a tad less common. The dungeon's difficulty is often compared to an Abyss as well, so I'm going to advise that you refrain from attempting the sewers until you've experimented with the other low-tier dungeons first. If you see a flock of players run in and all you're gonna do is wait at spawn and teleport to the Rusher, then sure go for it. But if you plan on clearing it with a few unmaxed characters, then there are definitely some challenges that you'll need to learn. First, this dungeon is long. It's not overrun with dead ends like the Abyss or UDL, but the sewers likes to lead you on for a while. To fool you into thinking that you're going the right way until being abruptly kicked in the face by a brick wall and being forced to turn around to find the right path. The way to the boss is usually shaped like a hook. Rarely is it ever straightforward, and you'll always enter it from the bottom. Similar to the Mad Lab's confusion room, if you happen upon this giant room with narrow grates to walk across, it's a good indicator that you're headed in the right direction. While I can't confirm that this is always the case, it has worked for me on most occasions. But if you see one of these rooms with a black square in the middle, it can automatically be ruled out as a dead end. Same thing goes for these diamond-shaped rooms. I don't know what it is, they just, they never go anywhere. Also, it's guaranteed for there to be exactly eight rooms between the spawn room and the boss. So if you've already been through a handful of rooms and still aren't very close, chances are there's a different way to go. But what makes this dungeon long isn't its length, Length, but the speed at which rooms are cleared. Like a real underground sewer system, in between the concrete walls and floors is a stream of sewage. When you step in it, your movement speed is slightly reduced, and you become inflicted with sick, preventing you from regaining any health so long as it's in effect. No matter how much vitality you have or how good your pet is, the recovery period in between rooms is a huge contrast from how the rest of the game is played. In a way, it's a lot like how Old Realm was, back when we had to take our time and plan our moves. And that's the main root of where this dungeon's difficulty stems from. I mean, yeah, rogues can still tear through it, especially with a plane walker. And I hear that paladins fare pretty well too, but every other class runs the risk of getting into a situation that they can't heal out of. Walking along the edges, of course, is the main workaround, but not only does that limit the amount of space you can move in, there are numerous points where you must cross the sewage to make it through. I guess the small hallways in between rooms don't sicken you, but because you have to run through the regular hallways to get there anyway, it's kind of a moot point. When it comes to the overall look of the dungeon, while I wouldn't exactly call it pretty, it is an accurate representation for the premise. The gritty, monochromatic tiles fit well with the dark and clearly hazardous sewer water. There are flies buzzing around, grates to walk across, dirty brick textures, mounds of, yeah, drainage vents in the walls, pillars, and dead bodies. Okay, a few questions. And the enemies are all exactly what we would expect to see. Alligators, rats, slimes, and Goblins. For the purposes of this guide, I'll be using my wizard, as it's the most commonly played beginner's class. I wouldn't say that you need any prerequisites stat-wise, however, being maxed on speed is recommended, since the sewer water slows you down a lot. But what I was shocked to find out during my solo was how unaggressive most of these enemies were. Of course, they all try to attack you, but aside from one or two, Nothing really pursues you, meaning nearly every enemy can be taken out from a safe distance. The alligator possesses a decently powerful V-shaped attack, but because the bullets have such a short lifespan, I rarely took damage from it, even when up close. The bats are just as basic as always. They have incredibly low health and rapidly fly around trying to bite you, applying a three-second confusion if successful. Pretty simple stuff. Then we have the slimes. The natural slime god is an enemy that you should be well acquainted with by now, and like its godland's counterpart, it can drop a defense potion only at a much higher rate. It's the yellow and brown slimes where a lot of the dungeon's danger comes from. They have identical behaviors, with an occasional radial shotgun dealing 30 and former armor-piercing damage respectively. The yellow one slows you and the brown one quiets you. But because they leave a slime trail behind them, which Realm I refers to as its brown magic, yeah, we're gonna have to talk about that, running through it can be just as lethal as running through lava. And with other potential enemies in the area, you may not be able to sustain that much damage. It takes a while for the lingering trail to fade away too, so be extra keen for that. I always step on it by accident. My general tip for approaching rooms is pretty self-explanatory. Lure anything that's directly on the other side and kill it before it reaches you. Since most enemies lack the ground speed to catch you, you can kill them before they even have the chance to return the favor. The rat enemies behave like you'd expect, only they're a lot faster than the ones found in Davy Jones's locker. They also have a surprisingly high 95 damage unstable attack, but the slow projectile speed allows you to easily move around and launch your own attack. Golden rats, however, are quite different. Rather than attacking you, when a 
player gets close to one, it'll squeak in the main chat and then start running away two seconds after. If it gets too far away, it'll despawn automatically, but if you don't kill it within about 15 seconds, it'll disappear anyway. Think of it like the rabbit from Mario 64, only on a time limit. If you catch it though, it drops a guaranteed defense for two people, and a chance at one of the white bags, so don't pass up the opportunity if it comes your way. Just be careful though, while running away, the golden rat might lead you into the other rooms full of enemies, putting you in harm's way and wasting your time. So try pushing it into a corner if you can. Finally, we have the goblins, the majority of the enemy pool. Goblin peons are weak little green dudes that have a randomly alternating 20 and 40 damage armor piercing attack. They're pretty easy to manipulate, so I don't find them very threatening, although they can apparently absorb the attacks of other enemies, which is kind of insane. The goblin knight is far tankier, with a powerful single shot that's easily avoided if singled out. The only time they cause trouble is if you're focusing on other enemies, but even then, you have to get pretty close to even activate them. The goblin sorcerer is a bit trickier. It's got this tight-knit five-shot spread attack that's a pain to dodge on melees, but it does open up for ranged classes. It moves around pretty erratically too, so it can be hard to predict where the next attack will be from, but the main threat is the confusing grenade. You know the drill by now. The goblin warlock is a bit of an oddball. They have this really funky amplitude on their shots. It looks super confusing at first, but I stood completely still in the middle and nearly every one of them missed. He even backs up a little bit, preventing the bullets from reaching you. There is a two second slow, which can be problematic when running away, but if you take things one at a time, that should never happen. Lastly, we have the goblin brute, the number one enemy you need to destroy. Much like the brutes of the abyss, the goblin brutes are fast and powerful. Four shots, rapid fire, and 90 damage per shot. If you're gonna die to anything that isn't the boss or a slime trail, it's this guy. Easily the biggest threat. But with average speed, he can be outsmarted. And because they fire at a split second delay, they can be circled, assuming you have the movement capabilities. There is also a treasure room that you may come across. I myself have only seen one or two in the hundreds that I've done, but then again, I've never intentionally hunted them down. Even so, I feel like it should be a little more common, like how the snake pit is. In any case, the treasure boss, Master Rat, can be located in a small square room with training dummies in the four corners. What's super cool about this is how it's a huge reference to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, with Master Rat being Master Splinter and asking the player one of five TMNT-esque questions, with a Rotmeg twist. Yeah, you don't actually fight him, you just gotta answer his trivia correctly. If you give the right answer, he'll summon the four turtles who drop a power pizza when killed, and a chance at the other white bag. Yeah, we straight up murder the Ninja Turtles before they can even mature. I don't know how I feel about this, but if you don't answer the question right, he'll explode into 16 different shots totaling at 800 damage, blinding and darkening you. Jeez, I'm sorry I didn't brush up on my lore. With all of that out of the way though, we at last move on to the boss fight. Gulpord, the Slime God. To continue with the Abyss of Demons parallels, there are three natural slime gods that you'll want to clear before activating. Gulpord will only start attacking once you've crossed over the first grate, even if you're invisible. His first phase lasts about 10 seconds and is pretty manageable. Five double shots in a star pattern, and eight armor-breaking stars that slightly shift clockwise in accordance with your position. It gives you a fair amount of room to dodge, but you can always back up to recover since Goldport is relegated to his square. Just make sure that the last room is clear of enemies. After that, he goes nuts. It's more or less the same attack as before, only he sits in the middle firing eight poison streams with an added slowing star all really close to one another. Easily the hardest part of the fight in my opinion. There was a somewhat safe area I was able to find that you could stand in and only take minimum damage from the slowing star, but if you're quick with your fingers, there is a way to dodge everything. It's just, you know, not easy. With enough damage, Gulpward can be pushed straight into phase two of his plan. But if not, he'll summon about eight or so Gulpward slimes that have their own AoE attack. And because of the inherent predictability of grenade arcs, this phase is heaps easier than the one before. But if you still don't feel cut out, the minions automatically despawn anyway, reverting back to the previous phase. When he's taken enough of a beating, he'll go under the water and split into two smaller halves with identical attacks. It can look hectic at first, but there are gaps you can squeeze through. When killed, they'll split apart again, only this time they're even smaller and nearly as powerful. Feel free to use the pillars as cover, it's very helpful. When they're all taken care of, Gulpord returns to the middle and glows red for a moment, entering his rage phase. He darts after the closest player, is completely immune to stun and paralyze, and is invulnerable for the first two seconds. This can be scary your first couple times, because if you mess up and get slowed, you only have a few seconds before he catches up and swallows you whole. If you cleared the last few rooms, then you can pull him in a straight line out of the boss room. But if you want to keep things contained, 
You can drag him off to the side and pull him around the corners. Turning does take some finesse, but as long as you keep an eye on that slowing star, you're in fine shape. You can afford to take a couple armor breaks or poison shots. You can always have someone else do it for you too if you don't feel up to it. Goldport, like the Golden Rat, drops a guaranteed defense potion for two players and some adequate item drops. The white bag contains either the powerful and unique Void Blade Katana for the ninja and the murky toxin for the assassin. All in all, the Toxic Sewers is a lot better than I give it credit for. After looking at it objectively, I see a lot of great qualities in it. The only reason that people dread it is because it actually takes some time. We're so accustomed to steamrolling these mid-level dungeons that when we actually have to try, we're too impatient to even give it the time of day. Maybe if it was just a tad smaller and the treasure rooms were a bit more common, players would feel more inclined to do these. In any case, it's a good dungeon, drops defense, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, don't forget to check out the next episode whenever I post it, which will probably be soon. Alright, see ya.